special in that through him God speaks directly to his people. He has been a leader, good administrator. He's been a friend. He is open to everyone. I want to be like him when I grow up. <laughs> And I could say so many things about him, but the short time that I've known him as Bishop of the Oklahoma Conference as well as the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. But he has meant so much to me, and I thank him for that. Thank you. Thank you. Having said that, there is one thing that we are most interested in at this hour. Is there a word from the Lord? From the Lord. Yes, and I'm sure it is from him that we will hear a word from our God. Present to you and also introduce to you our, our, our bishop, Robert E. Hayes. Amen. It is a joy to be back here at uh, Dallas Indian to share and worship with you this day because I look forward to this every year. I, I need for you all to know that uh, there are some questions being asked of me when people find out I come here every year. They say, what, what do they do to get you here every year? You haven't been to our church at all. But you go there every year. Well... It's partly because I got a meeting here every year about this time. As a matter of fact, usually I'm with you on the first Sunday in February. But there's this little game called the Super Bowl that made us move our game out of being up to the last Sunday in January. I don't know what that's all about, but they, uh, they moved our meeting and our meeting time up and all of that. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, they, they went to church today and then they they going to schedule lunch uh, Rudy at, at 12.30, they said, y'all never been to one of my Indian churches before then, and y'all scheduling, scheduling lunch that early in the, in the afternoon. So I said, I'll see y'all when I get there. <laughs> but it's a joy to be here with you today. I am just delighted to be in your company and in your presence. Mrs. Hayes and I really thank you for your kindness and your hospitality and your gift. It's a joy to be here. Brother Jackson will tell you that there are some sermons that you can write in a matter of hours. It just comes to you sometimes. There are some sermons that take days to write. This sermon that I'm going to share with you in a few minutes took me 30 years to write. Aren't you glad it's not going to take me 30 years to preach it? <laughs> But it took me that long to write it because, you see, God had to allow me to live through it before I understood it. You see, I, I couldn't have written this sermon when I was 20 some odd years old getting ready to go to seminary. I couldn't have written it when I came out of seminary. I couldn't have written it when I was 30 or 35. I had to live this sermon before I could understand it. And... It comes from a saying that my grandmother used to tell me. Thank God for wise grandmothers and grandfathers. Because she had a, a saying that, that stayed with me all these years. And she would always say when things got difficult, Son, I'm in a long fight with a short stick. I'm in a long fight with a short stick. It took me a long time to understand what she was talking about. But I'll tell you what it means in a minute. For my scripture today, I want to take it from 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and the 7th verse. 2 Corinthians 12. I'll give you time to find that. 
Because I love it when I see people turning pages and I hear Bible pages. But Brother Jackson, that, that just warms my heart to hear that. Amen. Second Amen. Corinthians. Amen. You got it there. 12, 7 through 10. Let me read these words for you because it's so... You, you know this, this story and these words Paul writes. <laughs> to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations that was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. And this is the line I like. For when I am weak, then I am strong. A long fight. With a short stick. Let us pray. Jesus. 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 There's just something. About that name. Master. Savior. Jesus. Like the fragrance. After the rain. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something. <laughs> something about that name. Amen. You know, so many times in my life, and probably your life too, we've come up against seemingly insurmountable odds. Many times, circumstances and difficulties would, would invade my life. And I know yours too, and, and, and we talked about this in Sunday school this morning. You know, when, when, when bad things happen, you know, we always question God, wondering, where is God right about now as I'm going through this hard time? You know, and, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, I go from questioning God, where is he, to getting upset, and then I get angry. And, and you know, and like I said, I'm not ashamed to admit that because that's a human response that we get upset and angry with God when bad things and Difficult circumstances invade our lives. I felt like, and this is what my grandmother taught me, I felt like God was forever putting me in a long fight with a short stick. And, and for those of you who don't know what that means, a short stick simply means that you never have enough of what you need. You know, it simply means that, uh, you know, my resources were always less than the demands that were placed on me. I, I was overwhelmed all the time by problems and there were hurdles that I couldn't jump over, walls that I couldn't go around. My life was always fighting, but it just always never seemed like I had enough. When the bills came due, I never had enough money. You've heard of robbing Peter to pay Paul? Well, I robbed Peter so much that he stopped coming around and didn't have anything. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, I remember when, when my first child was born, I, I didn't have gas money. I didn't have tuition for school. I, I didn't have money for food and diapers. I mean, it was, it was a long fight. And I had a short stick. I mean, at that time of my life, my credit was so bad, Sandra, that I had to have a cosigner when I paid cash. <laughs> That's bad credit. That's bad credit. I, I, I've been there. I know what that 
that's all about. And it was always just difficult. And then one day, I never will forget, I just celebrated this anniversary. One day on, on January the 28th, this was the, just this past week, that was the day the space shuttle exploded. But it was also a significant day in my life because 30 years ago on that day, the wheels came off of my ministry. I, I was at home uh, one morning and, and the superintendent called me. And the superintendent said, uh, uh, Bob, we're going to move you from the church where you were at. I had been there 11 years. We were getting ready to build a new church. We had the money in hand, everything. And he called me out the clear blue to see a, a pastor had died in the conference. And they were moving people around. And so they called me and said, we get ready to move you. I said, why now? Well, you got 30 minutes to think about it. I said, where you want to move me to? He said, we want to move you to Riverside Methodist Church. And then there was silence on the phone. And I said, Riverside? I said, that's an Anglo church. <laughs> you know, and for those of you who not follow me, I say, I'm, I'm, I'm at a black church. <laughs> Been there all 11 years. And now overnight, they want to move me to a white church. And I said, Dr. Parrott, that's an Anglo church. He said, yeah, we know. I said, well, you, you've never sent a black pastor to an Anglo church before. He said, yeah, we know. You'll be the first one. <laughs> then he said, I'm going to give you 30 minutes to think about it. Call me back. 30 minutes. And see, this is what happened at the end of a conference year. I was in my house that week on the 28th of January, I had to go tell my SPR committee that I was leaving. And when that meeting was over with, I got in my car. That's when I heard about the shuttle. I was crying so hard. And that was on like a Wednesday. And by that Sunday, I was in that pulpit. They didn't have any time to get ready for it. As a matter of fact, nobody told them I was coming. <laughs> The only people who knew was the SPRC committee. And for some reason, everybody but the chairman decided not to show up that Sunday. So here I am. February the 2nd, 1986. I walk out in my robe and everything. And when I walk out, I can just hear this gas in the audience say, Oh, Lord. <laughs> And people start looking at their programs and say, where did he come from? And so I got up and I preached the only way I knew how to preach. Amen. Like a black preacher. You know, like I'm preaching to you right now. They weren't ready for that. And I could tell because as I was preaching, they were sitting back there like this. And I was checking them out. I believe if somebody sneezed, we would have all run out of there. Because <laughs> it was the tension was so tight. Yes. Wow. And so after the service was over with, I saw a few people huddling in the in the north there, yeah. in the outer yeah. part of the church. They were be careful when people huddle yeah. on you. <laughs> At the end of the service. Yeah. And I went on to my office, and a few minutes later. It was the SPRC chairperson. His name was Bob Hawk. And Bob came in and said, can we talk? I said, yeah. He said, this ain't going to work. <laughs> I started saying, well, why don't you just tell me how you really feel? Huh? <laughs> this ain't going to work. I said, why? He said, well, you preach too long. Uh -oh. We won't even beat the Baptist to the cafeteria today. <laughs> then he said, you preach too loud. Uh -oh. I'm telling y'all the truth, I can't make this up. He said, you preach too loud. And then he said, you even threaten some of us. <laughs> he said everything but the right thing. You know what he was, you know. He didn't say that. 
So I said, is there anything good? No, he said, no. And he left. <laughs> so I sat in my chair. And I said, God, where are you? Why did you send me here? There ain't too many places that a pastor with only one hour of service can go to from here, you know? I ain't been here but an hour, hour and a half. Where you going? I knew they were going to call the bishop the next morning. And so I said, God, why? And you know, it's strange how God works. Because that Tuesday, I had to go hear a preacher preach. And I didn't want to go, but I went anyway. And when I got there, Brother Jackson, the preacher got up and he started preaching on Moses and the burning bush. I mean, I, I heard the story, but I, I was hurt and I was in despair. And, and, he, and he turned his Bible to Exodus 3 and he read that story of Moses and how out of curiosity he saw the burning bush. And Moses said, let me go see why this bush is not consumed. And so the Bible says that he went up and he looked. And when he got there, he heard this voice say, take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground. And Moses took his shoes off. And it was there that he heard the voice say, I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries. And I want you, yeah. Moses, to go and bring them out of Egypt. Oh, I can just imagine that Moses heard that and looked around and, and <laughs> didn't see nobody else there. He said, you want me? Me to go to Egypt? No, you can't be serious. He said, I, I, I'm, I'm a stutter. I can't, I can't do that. He said, first thing they're going to do when I get there, is ask me who had the audacity to send me to get the children out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't even know who you are. What's your name? And the voice came back and said, I am yes, yes. who I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, is that all you're going to give me? <laughs> I can see me going to Pharaoh saying, I am sent me. You know, and, and, and then Pharaoh has thousands of chariots and hundreds of thousands of men. What am I going to take to free them? I, I need all more chariots. I need more men. What am I going to take to defeat them? And the voice said, What's in your hand? And Moses said, A stick? He said, take that. Wait a minute. Let me read the minutes of this meeting back to you. I am. You want me, Moses, to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let the children go. And, and when they ask me who sent me, I'm going to say, I am. And now, when you, when you say, take the stick to go... This is not making any sense. And I began to see something emerging out of that sermon. Because you see, whenever God sends us to do something, we make the same mistake that Moses did. We're guilty of it. In our eyesight, what God gives us is never enough. But in the eyesight of God, it's more than enough to get the task done. And so I left that, that, that worship service. And, and I ran home and I, and I sat down and I thumbed through my Bible. And nearly on every page, I realized that everybody that God called yeah. to serve him always thought that they didn't have enough to do what God wanted them to do. Just, God's call to Gideon. His response in Judges 6. Gideon said, I'm the least in my father's house. How shall I defeat the Midianites? Over Nehemiah, when he had to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem for 52 days. How am I going to do that? And then in, in, in David, in 1 Samuel, when he's getting ready to go and fight Goliath. 
he goes and finds five smooth stones. You see, in every situation, people thought that they didn't have enough. And, and, and that, my brothers and sisters, is how we look at it. We always conclude that God has shortchanged us. That God has put us in a long fight and hadn't given us anything but a short stick. You know, I've been a bishop just about 12 years now. And I was a superintendent eight years before that. That means I've been out of organized religion for 20 years in administration. Y'all would get that on your way home, but it has nothing to do with organized religion. And you know, as a district superintendent and as a bishop, I think that I have heard every short stick excuse from every church that I've ever served. When confronted with the impossible, congregations and churches can think of some really neat excuses as to why that's impossible. And I call them short stick excuses. Let me, let me, see, let me run a couple of passages and see if they sound familiar. We don't have enough money to do that. Have you heard that before? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Here's another one. We don't have enough people to do that before. To do that. And, and here's another one. We never heard anything like that. It won't work. Oh, we've never tried it before. And it won't work. And then one, why do we have to try this at all? Is this coming from the pastor or the trustees? Or maybe the United Methodist women? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, I, I know where the exit signs are. <laughs> when I came in here, in case I have to leave in a hurry. Tell it, tell it, tell it. Tell you see, it. we come up with these short stick excuses. Mm -hmm. And we convince ourselves that we don't have enough to do that. But if you don't hear anything else I say to you today, I want to remind you of a very basic fundamental. And if you don't remember anything else, remember this one. People, God doesn't make long sticks. All right, get this now. God doesn't make long sticks. You see, God is not in the business of just giving us everything we need for every task. God is not in the business of just declaring victory every time we just go and ask him for, you know, some of our prayers are give me this, Lord, give me that, Lord, do this for me, Lord. If God did that every time we prayed, you know what? We would soon feel the need to eliminate God. Yes. We would become gods ourselves. And we would parade around saying, oh, like those rascals do. Oh. <laughs> Look at what I have done. Look at what we have done. We didn't even need God to do this. And that's the lesson you need to hear because it, it shows up in Paul's passage here. Because Paul writes very clearly that he had an infirmary. He had something wrong with him. The problem was acute and troubling. We don't know. It could have been epilepsy. It could have been any kind of disease. We don't know exactly what it was. But Paul called it a thorn. Did you hear the church? Say a thorn with me. A thorn in his flesh. A messenger of Satan. It was given to me by Satan, Paul concludes. Because it's troubling me. He considered it a Satan sent torment. And the scripture said that he went to God. Yes. And he pleaded with God. Not one time. Not two times. But three times. He pleaded with God. Take this thorn away from me. And Paul writes that the Lord said, my grace 
is sufficient for you. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? My grace is sufficient for you. Hallelujah. For it's in your shortcomings. Mm -hmm. It's in your weaknesses. It's in your insults. It's in your hardships. It's in your persecutions and difficulties that you come to understand the power of God through Christ. Yeah. And what it has over your life. You know my friend. I really thought I knew something about the Bible. But that's why that 30 years. I really thought I knew something. About the scriptures. But it was not until I realized. Later in my life. That my deficiencies are there for a reason. My weaknesses are there for a reason. You see, and, and, and when I find myself on the losing end with this short stick of life, when I find myself engaged in these long fights with nothing but a short, it's precisely at that point that God steps in and takes over. That's why Paul says, for, for when I am at my weakest, when I know I can't win the fight all by myself, mm -hmm. I know who can win the battle for me. And that's when I'm at my strongest. Glory. I always wondered why Paul was able to say, Then I gladly boast yes. about these things. I can delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships mm -hmm. and in persecutions and difficulties. But when I give in to that weakness and go to God, then then I'm strong. I want you to look back over your lives. I want you to remember those times when life brought you to your knees. Literally brought you to your knees. And while you were on your knees, you realized that you had nowhere else to go but to God. Yes. You see, that's what I'm talking about. When you realize that, that God has removed all those things that, that make you think you're all of this and all of that. Mm -hmm. When you realize you're not all of this or all of that. And when you get knocked to your knees, there's only one place to go. And that's the go. And then you go in the kind of spirit <laughs> that says, God, I, I can't do it by myself. <laughs> I need your help. I tell you a story. Mm -hmm. One day, a, a mother and her son, he was about nine, they went to the swimming hole close to the house. And at the swimming hole, there was a fisherman down the road. He was just casting out lines. And the little boy went to swim. His mother went to watch him. He was a good swimmer. He took off his shoes and he dove into the water. And he just started like a, like a good swimmer, swimming out. And on the way back, he got tired. And he started fighting the water. And he started yelling, help, help. And he started going up and down and up and down. And the mother panicked. And she looked at the fisherman and said, come, come help me, come help me. And the fisherman ran down and stood next to her. And the little boy was going up and down. And she said, go get him, go. And he didn't do anything. He stood right there. She said, go get him, go get him. And he stood there and waited for another minute. And the mother was just about hysterical then. And finally, the fisherman dove into the water, swam out to the little boy, and brought him back to the shore. And they revived him. And he coughed up the water and started breathing. And after things had settled down, the mother said, why didn't you go and get him when I asked you to? He said, ma'am, if I had gone and gotten him when you wanted me to, he was still too strong. You see, if I had gotten to him then, he would have drowned both of us. Yes. I had to wait, he said, until he got to his weakest point. And when he got to his weakest moment, I was able to go out and get him. That's how God works. We're walking around here like we own the world, like we've done all this, this, that, and the other. And, and we don't know that some point something is going to happen. 
And we're going to have that short stick. And we're going to wonder, where? Where is God at this moment? And we'll realize that God is waiting for us to get to that weakest point, like Paul says, before he can come and help us. Because you see, God is still in control of our going out and our coming in. God, there's nothing about you that God doesn't know. My favorite psalm is Psalm 139. Lord, you, you know, you search me, you know me. Before I can even say anything, you know what I want to say. Before I can think it, you know what I'm going to think. Where can I go without your spirit? You see, God is in control. His hand governs our lives. And right now, when you give in to that short stick and say, oh, I can't do it with this short stick. God, I need your help. Just remember that God doesn't make long sticks of victory. He wants you to use that short stick as best as you can. And when it ain't, when you find out it ain't enough, that's when you call on. Let me close with this. Back in the days of the Old West, a little girl and her parents went to the general store in this little western town to buy supplies for the farm. When they got there, the mother and father started looking all around the store buying the supplies. And the little girl, who couldn't have been over 10, stood right by the counter still and quiet. The store owner, she caught his attention and he went to her and said, how old are you? She said, 10. He said, young lady, I've never seen a 10 year old behave as good as you. Get, get some candy out the jar there. She said, no, thank you very much. A good while passed, Matthew, and, and the little girl stood there the whole time. And the store owner came back and said, young lady, you are mature beyond your years. Get some candy out of the jar. And she said, no, thank you. Finally, his patience had run out. So he reached in the jar and got hands full of candy and put it in her little apron. And on the way home, the little girl's daddy said, honey, I've never known you to be that shy. Why, why didn't you get the candy when the store owner asked you? And with a little smile on her face, she said, because his hands were bigger than mine. <laughs> Down is India. God's hands are bigger than yours. You don't own or control anything. It's all in God's hand. And the sooner you realize that, the better off you'll be. You have been given a short stick on purpose. Go ahead. You will never have enough. You will never be able to gain the victory by yourself. You're going to need God at some point or another. And you might as well realize now that God has put you in life with a short stick. And I had to learn that. I had to live that before I could write this sermon. Because on that day that they told me that it wasn't going to work at Riverside. That had to bring me down to my weakest point. Do you know what it feels like when people say, we don't want you, this is not going to be good enough. For, and it was at that point, my weakest point, that I went to God. And I said, it's out of my hands now. I need your help. And to make a long story short, I stayed at that church for nine years. <laughs> my walk, my picture. Yeah. They had the nerve to put my picture on the wall. All those white faces, and then there's this little, little, little dot. <laughs> this little dot down at the end. And when I left, they put a banner up on the balcony after nine years. And the banner said, our differences enrich us. Our differences enrich us. 
and I went back just a few months ago to preach the 75th anniversary. And that was Bob Hawk, the one who came into my office. And when he saw me and I saw him, we just hugged. A long fight with a short stick. Be glad about it. Because when you realize that short stick is not going to win the battle, there's only one place, one person who can do it for you. Lord. It's Almighty God. Thank you, Thank you.